So my next introduction is for uh, Nancy Renee. Um, this is really a wonderful opportunity for me to introduce somebody who fulfills a role in our society that's desperately needed and that's challenged by the budget in this state, and that's the education of our children. Um, it's really critical that we, we face the challenges that the lack of education that's going to occur in this state because of the financial crisis is going to have a long-term impact on our society, on our state, and on the health and well-being of children. But Nancy stands up for those causes. Um, she's been an educator with over 40 years of experience working with children and young adults. She began teaching in 1964 for the Los Angeles Unified School District. She's worked as an assistant pr principal at a number of schools and an advisor in the field of mathematics. In 1996, she became the principal at Dorsey High School in Los Angeles. Um, she retired from the school district in 2001, but she did not retire from education. As a private consultant, she had worked with a number of school districts to help them improve teaching and learning in their schools. And she has worked with the Los Angeles County Office of Education and provided information to principals on meeting curriculum standards. Now, the reason that she was chosen to come here is that she has two special needs grandchildren. Uh, Valerie, age 12, has autism, and Joseph, age 8, has been diagnosed with sickle cell disease and has already had a stroke at a much earlier age that she will tell you about. She became active in organizations that support these issues. You can see she's such a positive person to have these challenges in her life. Uh, it is remarkable to be able to deal with them, and I think she's dealing with them in the most positive way. She facilitates an autism support group at the West Side Y, which meets on a monthly basis. She has also done extensive work with the Sickle Cell Foundation of California, leading workshops for parents and writing a short book booklet, uh, teaching students with sickle cell disease. The booklet is used in counseling parents and teachers of children with the disease. She believes that education is the key to success in every setting, and we should all believe that. Nancy. Thank you so much for inviting me, and of course, thank you for the wonderful work that you are doing. You may have made a big mistake. Don't invite a grandmother who likes to talk and has access to a screen to show pictures of her grandchildren. I mean, is this a big mistake or what? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you a little bit about my grandson, Joseph, and uh, he's really doing okay. But every story about a child begins with their parents. There's mom and dad. They knew that sickle cell disease was a possibility because of the newborn screening program that was mentioned earlier. Thank you for that. They have an older daughter, that's the one who's autistic, and that's the one that told them that they both carried the sickle cell gene. We knew that dad had the sickle cell gene because he has a brother with sickle cell disease. But my daughter did not know that she carried the sickle cell trait. No one in her family, and I knew that family going back for generations, had the disease, but the trait stayed on. So thank you, Dr. Lubin, for the newborn screening program because when Joseph was born, he got tested. They knew right away that he had sickle cell disease, and they were able to begin some of the treatments that have been proven to extend life, such as the uh, penicillin procedures, so that uh, he remained healthy for the first few months of his life. There he is in all of his glory. He was doing fine. You know, babies are born with that fetal hemoglobin. But after their normal hemoglobin begins to kick in, they're more susceptible to sickle cell disease. And when he was nine months old, he started crying and wouldn't stop. Couldn't stop, could not be comforted. They took him to the hospital. He went from one hospital, which perhaps didn't feel that they were capable of treating an infant with sickle cell disease, into the Kaiser Hospital on Sunset he had a stroke at nine months of age. You know how when babies cry, they just cry with everything. They're crying, arms are moving, legs are moving. 
I saw him the next day and the right side was completely silent. He's still crying and moving his left arm and left leg, but that right side was silent. His father, later recognizing that um, he remembered oxygen and hydration were important for sickle cell, it was important for his brother. He didn't know whether or not the doctors were doing it and he sort of kicked himself for not mentioning it. And yet with sickle cell patients, they often find that doctors who are caring for the patient are not as up on basic knowledge about sickle cell as they should be. So we began a series of transfusions, medications, blood tests that continue to this day. The stroke left him weak on the right side, but I tell you, being a little boy trumps having a stroke. It's not like a stroke that you would see with a 70-year-old, you know, and they're still kind of going along, uh-uh. Here's Joseph at about uh, four years old. Now you see those curtains in the background? It's not that he's a giant kid. He was jumping on the bed. <laughs> And so far, the transfusions, the hydroxyurea, the medication for iron overload have really helped. He's only had two small pain episodes and thank goodness, no more strokes. But this happens because he has enough family support for the constant doctor visits, for blood tests. He has a port. His mother flushes the port regularly. All families really can't do that. You know, when you're dealing with sickle cell clients because of the way our society operates, you're often dealing with people in poverty. So they may not have access to good medical care. And at the Sickle Cell Foundation, one of the things that we get asked the most is simply money for transportation to take their child to the hospital for the needed procedures. Education is key. Dr. Lubin mentioned that, that I've been an educator since 1964. Understanding the disease from the patient, from the parent standpoint, and from the medical community is absolutely key. So that people understand the importance of medication for iron overload. We had a client of the foundation die recently due to the effects of iron overload. So what about Joseph's life today? Remember I said you invited a grandmother up here and we have pictures. He's doing well. He wears a brace on his leg, but he runs just as fast as the other kids. He rides his two-wheeler, so he's got a pedal with both sides and he's got to coordinate and do all of those things. He handles the medication well and he understands why he has to take the medication. He understands why he has to go to the doctor every six weeks or so for a blood transfusion. And he really does not cry. He understands that this is kind of his thing in life and he's gonna make sure that he does it well. And even when they have to hunt for that vein in his arm, you know how after they make the uh, initial injection but they don't quite hit the vein and they're kind of searching around, you know how much that hurts? He doesn't cry. But there are some concerns the parents are concerned any time they go on a vacation. Will there be good care should a crisis occur? And don't even think about going to a foreign country because you simply do not know what would happen. Even though Joseph's teachers are aware that he has sickle cell disease, they sometimes question the absence like they don't believe it's really what we say it is. They, and unfortunately, they're not very accommodating with older kids. I've worked with older kids at the foundation and they get caught up in all this. How many times have you been absent? Well, you've been absent more than 10 times, so now you're going to not pass the course or you have all of this paperwork. And when uh, the teen says, well, I have to take regular breaks for water because remaining hydrated is absolutely key, the teacher may say something like, are oh, you just trying to get out of the test? You're trying to get out of running the 100 you know, the 100-yard dash or whatever it happens to be. So uh, we find that many, many people in the general population simply do not understand sickle cell disease. Family has concerns for the future. Will he continue to get good care? 
Will he have any additional complications? What about the chest syndrome? Will he have another stroke? And will racism continue to affect the care of sickle cell patients? Dr. Cohn talked about uh, the number of people with sickle cell disease. This was a, a study that w I was referred to, comparing sickle cell disease with cystic fibrosis. 80,000 people have sickle cell disease compared with about 30,000 people with cystic fibrosis. NIH funding for sickle cell was 90 million. For cystic fibrosis, about a third of the number of people, 128 million. For the sickle cell patient, $1,100. For cystic fibrosis, over $4,000 per patient. Philanthropic support, about a half million for sickle cell disease, 1.5 million for cystic fibrosis. I can't tell you why that is. I'm just telling you that it is. Currently, adults in particular report poor care. They report not being taken seriously when they go into the emergency room. And I'm going to tell you, because I think maybe no one else will, I have sat at the UCLA hospital with a friend's daughter who was suffering a severe pain crisis. It was a pain crisis. It became an infection. It became acute chest syndrome. And I would sit with her. And one of the machines next to her was going off. Beep, beep. She says, that's driving me nuts. Beep, beep. I go into the hallway and ask the nurse. I said, the machine is beeping. Can you come do something? So she came and turned the machine off. And I said, well, why was it beeping? Well, she says, it's out of pain medication. Now, this young woman was suffering a crisis so severe that when you asked her, what her pain levels were on a scale of 1 to 10, she would say 15. It's like being hit in the shins over and over again, all over your body. And yet, the nurses thought, oh, well, the machine is beeping. Oh, well, that must mean it's empty. And when I said, well, could we fill it back up? Well, I'd have to call the pharmacy, she said. Yeah. And it might take an hour and a half. Well, wait a minute. I know that those machines have the numbers on them and that the numbers say something like time remaining. The layperson can figure out, oh, yeah, time remaining means that you better call the pharmacy if you need to order the next batch of medication so that the patient in severe pain does not remain in severe pain any longer than necessary. I hear from adults that come through our foundation that they are often accused of being drug seekers. That, you know, hey, especially if you happen to be an African American male, you must be going to the emergency room to get drugs. It can't be that you're in a severe sickle cell crisis. Those stereotypes that pervade our society are with us even in the medical community. But having said all of that, Joseph's doing well. You could see from the pictures that I've showed you that he's doing well. And I simply want to applaud all of you for the work that you have done and the work that you are doing. Without the newborn screening, who knows what would have happened had the parents not realized that Joseph was suffering a sickle cell crisis. Who knows whether or not doctors would have recognized what was happening. Since then, we have transcranial Doppler so that kids who are uh, potential stroke victims can be uh, screened with the Doppler to see whether or not a stroke is, is in the uh, future. And of course, thank you for thinking about preparing for writing and working on this hugely important grant. This is something that will really make a 
large difference to the community, to those patients and their families with sickle cell disease. So we can't thank you enough. And all I can say is, you know, the, the two doctors here who have been working on this, yes, they got polite applause. When Lady Gaga goes on stage, people are jumping up and whistling and carrying on. Are we nuts or what? This is something that can really make a difference in the lives of kids and adults and families. And I certainly cannot thank you enough for making it happen. Thank you, Nancy, for sharing the story of Joseph with us. Uh, it is the story of each patient with sickle cell disease or many of the other chronic illnesses we face that inspire each of us to our work every day. I'd like to ask quickly, are there any uh, questions from any member of the audience for Dr. Cohn or for Nancy or for Dr. Lubin? I think we've, got, we've obtained the maximum output for the, for the hour and a little bit more, uh, but it is an inspiring story that will carry all of us through thousands of hours in the future of dedicated work. Uh, we will convene our meeting and uh, thank you, Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Dr. Lubin. Thank you, Nancy. And thank Joseph for us. He, he's the real hero. Thank you.